Something has changed. History is truly at a turning point. We will not go back into an overall rules-based, cooperating uh, global system. It will be a rivalry. Professor Klaus Schwab, the founder and executive chairman of the World Economic this Forum. This is the panel people have been waiting for. Some of for. the biggest leaders in politics and business World gathered. Leaders, corporate giants, top academics, they're all coming together in Davos, Switzerland today. It's the start of the 54th World Economic Forum. Klaus Schwab says it's crucial that leaders meet in person as it helps create trust between them. The future lies in being smart, which means digital, being green, and being connected. I think the game changer would be the use of technology. One factor uh, for success is public-private cooperation. But the second factor... Is that the right way to think about this going forward? Yes, but... Very good morning to all of us at this very special event, the ASEAN Business Investment Summit of 2023. I'm delighted and honored to be sitting next to Professor Klaus Schwab, who is the founder and executive chairman of the World Economic Forum. Professor, you insisted that I call you by the first name. Yeah, you are Gita, <laughs> and uh, I'm pleased to be Klaus. Thank you so much. I, I want to begin the discussion with a pretty general question. You've, you've been making remarks about what it takes to be in a position of leadership. Uh, you've, you've mentioned aptly some of the attributes uh, that are needed for somebody to be in a position of leadership. But, but I want to make this a little bit more colorful by way of putting this in the context of how the world has shifted in terms of the global order, from a rather unipolar to a much more multipolar. You've talked about the heart, the muscles, the brain, the soul, and the good nerves. Please, Professor. No, thank you, Gita. And, uh, it's a particular pleasure for me to be together with you. Uh, I mean, I knew you in your former uh, capacity very well, and now you have become an intellectual, so it's a delight, a delight uh, to, to be together. And I want to express also my appreciation for Ashat uh, C. Kadeen, uh, chairman. Um, we have such a good cooperation with Indonesia, so I'm delighted to be here. But uh, to respond to your question, um, when we look at the world, and uh, when we met in Davos early this year, people spoke about a multi-crisis, but actually we are in a multi-transformation. And we can go into the specific detail, details. It's a uh, economic transformation. It's a political, geopolitical, geopolitical transformation. And uh, of course, it's also a technological and it's even a societal transformation. Now, coming back to your first, uh, to, to your introductory question, um, and I think we all are interested to know what, what type of leadership do we need in this new world, which is full of complexities, full of uncertainties, full of unknowns. So, you refer to it. My, I have met so many people around the world, so many leaders. And of course, in my own uh, teaching career, I had to read uh, tons of books about leadership. But actually, it comes down to five elements. Soul, brain, heart, muscles, and nerves. So what, what does it mean? See, the soul stands for 
really having a mission in life, having a vision about the future, because the old fashioned, uh, fashion strategic uh, planning to a certain extent is out. You cannot predict exactly anymore the future. But you have to have a vision because people will believe in you only if you are driven by values or by a vision. Then, of course, you need the brains. You have to be a professional in your life. And you need the heart. Passion and compassion. I, I think a leader is credible if he shows passion and compassion. And the muscles. You have to translate your vision into action. And finally, in the world of today, you need good nerves. So it would be very interesting uh, to ask the question, who is actually today a leader in the world who, who uh, let's say, corresponds to all the five criteria? But I leave it to you because uh, to, to, to look at, uh, let's say, uh, the respective leaders. Interesting, Professor. I want to share with you an observation about how Southeast Asia has fared in the last 30 years. If you were to compare with, I mean, Southeast Asia's performance with that of China in the last 30 years, from a GDP per capita standpoint, it's, it's rather telling in the sense that the GDP per capita of Southeast Asia in the last 30 years has grown by about 2.7 times, whereas China's GDP per capita in the same period has grown by 10 times. It's, it's largely attributable to four attributes. The first one being the under investment in infrastructure by Southeast Asia. The second, the under investment in education by Southeast Asia. The third would be governance related. And the fourth would be the lack of competitiveness in Southeast Asia. I want to seek your wisdom on what you think Southeast Asia can do in the next 30 years. And, and I say this with full optimism that we should be able to get way past 2.7 times in the last, I mean, in the next 30 years. Let's um, also not uh, forget that uh, maybe the ASEAN countries are a late starter. So if you compare uh, with China, and uh, I followed uh, China's uh, opening up and reform policies in 79. Uh, it was a very integrated policy and actually uh, coming back to this notion of you need a vision so it was a very strong vision, um, starting with Chairman Deng at that time, um, for China. And I, I see now a similar vision about the future of ASEAN is developing. And even if you take, uh, I mean, the high uh, compared to the, to the global, um, uh, average, the relatively high uh, global growth rate of let's say five to six percent, it means doubling GDP of the ASEAN region every 12 to 13 years. So this will be a remarkable progress. But also something has changed. And uh, if, if uh, I look at uh, this region and I would give some imperatives, which by the way, uh, are very evident also the whole um, communication about those so meetings here this week. I think the future lies in being smart, which means digital, being green and being connected. Let me, let me, um, elaborate shortly on, on those issues. Uh, the first one is a smart or digital, um, and but particularly using artificial intelligence. We have to be careful that we don't think in terms of different stages of industrial development. And now we, we see ASEAN countries focus on manufacturing and saying, no, um, 
uh, artificial intelligence and all those technologies of the fourth industrial revolution will be the next step. No, the, the um, success will be in the combination already now of the best production uh, um, capabilities, which, by the way, include to a large extent today artificial intelligence. Um, if we talk about a green economy, people feel green that's an obligation in order only to keep uh, our uh, nature um, in a good shape um, and uh, to fight climate change. No, it will be in the future a strong competitive factor because green energy with all the innovations which have already been made or which will be made um, will be superior in terms of costs. So a country which moves very fast into green technologies uh, acquires a competitive advantage. And connected, um, I feel the future in this uh, disintegrating world um, will be based on global cooperation, but here regions will play the role of strong pillars of the system. And I'm a big believer in the, uh, we spoke about it uh, before coming in, I'm a big believer in mid-powers. It's not just China and the US. I think the new world is a very complex world. Um, it's a multipolar world, dominated maybe by two or three giants, but the middle powers like Indonesia, uh, like Saudi Arabia, like Brazil, will play a very crucial role in this new, uh, in this new geopolitical, geoeconomic context. I want to, I want to pick up on this point because as the world is becoming much more multipolar, ironically, I've been saying a few times in the past that multilateralization is at risk to the point where we are sort of like push to bilateralize a little bit more than before. And that just intuitively requires countries around the world to focus more on becoming more competitive and more productive. Is that the right way to think about this going forward? Yes, but le let's look what happened. Um, we had the golden age of globalization started probably around 89 with the fall, with the, with the end of the Cold War. And it lasted until four or five years ago. And it was a combination of different factors. It was on the one hand, the driving down of production costs through global supply chains. It was lifting hundreds of millions of people out of poverty. And it was governments who eased the process by creating a plain level field. Now, uh, and it was business, it was mainly a demand driven uh, global economy. And it was business which was in the driver's seat. The situation has changed. Today, governments are much more back in the driver's seat because governments have become more interventionist. And there are several reasons. The first reason is, of course, um, the, the COVID pandemic, which uh, uh, caused governments to intervene much more into the economy, to protect the economy. But then you should not forget we have the race for domination in the new technologies. And the fourth industrial revolution is different for compared to the previous technological revolutions. Because in the first uh, technological revolution, uh, let's say a steam engine, you still could copy it. Um, even you could copy uh, uh, a primitive uh, computer. But today, to copy a, um, a complex algorithm, or a big database, it has become very difficult. So I, I feel the economy is global. To come back to your question, global competition will be driven much more by who masters the fourth industrial revolution. 
because mm. being first mover or first adapter of those new technologies provides you with an enormous competitive advantage. And what we see also now in the competition between the US and China is not just about which is the dominating global economy or the largest global economy. It's who is really mastering the fourth industrial revolution, which provides enormous power, of course, not only um, in economic competitiveness, but also uh, in using um, new power on a global basis. But it would be interesting. I mean, you are uh, an expert in those in this area. Well, what is your really. what, uh, Kita, what is your opinion? Well, I'm I'm sitting here with a lot of optimism for Southeast Asia going forward. I mean, if if you were to take a look at the baseline growth rate trajectory for Southeast Asia for the next twenty years, I think it's easy to assume that you should be able to get two to five percent range. By way of conventional wisdom. But if you were to add on to that artificial intelligence, call it the fourth industrial revolution. And, and if you were to refer to pundits on this particular topic, some might have referred to a potential economic delta of about 30 to $50 trillion. Some would even go to the extent of a hundred trillion dollars. So if we were to just be able to capture a little bit of that, I think Southeast Asia is poised for a really, really great economic future, way beyond a 5% growth trajectory baseline. I would, I would agree with you. I'm, I'm a great optimist for this region, yeah. based um, on its entrepreneurial force. I have seen so many entrepreneurial Fun. people in this region. Um, uh, but based also on, um, let's say, its innovative capabilities, um, its young generation, um, uh, not fearing uh, technologies, new technologies. That's a big problem. Why do we have a polarization in, in, in societies in Europe and in, in, in um, uh, the U.S.? It comes, well, one of the factors is that older people do not necessarily understand anymore all the complexity um, in geopolitics, in geoeconomics, and particularly in technology. And so they have the feeling they lose control over their lives. Now, here in this region, you have so many people who want to embrace the new world because they see it as an opportunity to improve their lives and to make progress. So um, I'm a big believer of that. Um, let's not fall into the trap of we have to first really master the third industrial revolution, which means manufacturing, and then to move into the fourth industrial revolution. Because artificial intelligence is a system technology, which means every aspect of industrial production and also distribution consumption will be penetrated by artificial intelligence. So to use, let's say, the, uh, the manufacturing revolution and to combine it immediately with the, with the new capabilities of artificial intelligence could be the strengths of this region. Look forward to that. I want to pick up on the earlier point you brought up uh, in the context of U.S. and China, right? Do you see U.S. and China being in an, kind of an Ali Frazier kind of fight, or do you see this as a zero-sum game? No, I think we, we, we move... Um, into a situation of a multipolar world, as we just said, with the two, uh, let's say, being the big elephants uh, in the room, we will not go back to a completely, even if we do have to make efforts, 
into an overall rules based um, um, cooperating uh, global system. It will be a rivalry. And um, the rivalry is not only in terms of competitiveness, it's in terms of values, it's in terms of systems. And that um, we are one humanity and we are faced with survival challenges. We, uh, 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 as far as the climate is, change is concerned, but even in artificial intelligence, uh, there are some people who say, if we don't keep the ghost in the bottle, uh, it may mean even a threat to our humanity. So we have common problems and we could add migration, we could add many, many else. We could add that the World Economic Forum is now at the moment very much engaged in finding uh, common governance rules for uh, artificial intelligence. So there are areas, and we are working here together with many governments, with uh, the leading companies. There are areas where we absolutely have to work together. So we will not come back to an overall integrated system, but we have to find the touch point right. in this, let's say, multitude of relations where we really have to create win-win situation because we depend so much each on another. Interesting. Professor, in Southeast Asia, we've got 10 economies or governments, four of which are monarchies, some of which are trying to be democracies, and you've got two single-party countries, and then the rest are democracies, multi-party democracies, right? What, what do you think in your mind is the right kind of framework for a PPP strategy to be well executed in this part of the world? I think today is the uh, crucial factors. Well, let me, let me go back uh, to a discussion which influenced me very much. One of the wise people of uh, former um, my minister, um, explained to me, I think it was 30 years ago, um, what the art of uh, governance is, particularly also looking at the differences between the US, Europe, and uh, this part of the region. And he mentioned, um, it's always to find the right equilibrium between the individual and the collective. Mm. And whatever the government form is, I think this is today even more important because um, the individual crea is the base for creativity, for innovation and so on. But we have to keep in mind the collective interest. So how do you, how do you find the right equilibrium? And I think it's not so much, uh, this is a question for every country in the world. Um, but again, uh, you, uh, in your teaching capability and uh, as a professor, what is your opinion? I've, I've been spending quite a lot of time with uh, the young people who are trying to be entrepreneurs. And I've, I've been advocating that it's important for them to think about becoming an entrepreneur despite the government, not because of the government. That creates, I think, a higher degree of resilience. You've talked a lot about resilience, right? And, and I think to the extent that the young generation learns to be surviving, even better thriving, despite, instead of because of the government, that I think will create a much more nimble type of framework to the extent that the government becomes more proactive in providing support to entrepreneurship, then I think it becomes, it's, it's, it's a plus and a bonus. It, uh, it, should, it should actually not be despite the government, but it should be with the governments. Uh, I mean, the, 
The World Economic Forum is the global organization. We have this international status uh, to foster public-private cooperation. And um, today we have to think in systems. If you look, for example, at uh, solving the climate change issue, it's a very complex uh, system um, uh, related to nature, related to decarbonization of industries and so on. But governments and business today are so intertwined, so it needs public-private cooperation. And my, my argument would be the countries which really have the best systems of public-private cooperation will see the winners of tomorrow because they can act faster. And the recipe for tomorrow in the old world, in the old world, it was the, the big fish which ate the small fish. Now in the new world, it's a fast fish, which eats the slow fish. And the ASEAN countries have the capability to be the fast fish. We have uh, China, America, the big we have fish. We a lot of fast fish here. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. But um, that's one, one uh, let's say, uh, one factor uh, for success is public-private cooperation. And it has to be as much as possible institutionalized, uh, not in formalistic ways, but in very flexible ways uh, to reach common objectives, to create a common mission, to have a common vision, and so on. But the second factor, which also speaks, let's say, against this artificial division, or not anymore, uh, let's say, um, appropriate division of governments and business. Because in the past, business was, business was mm -hmm. regarded, um, to be just here to create, um, prosperity and to work for the owners. But today I'm propagating what we call now stakeholder capitalism because which means the business has to create prosperity, certainly, long-term prosperity, but business is also a social organism, and business has to take care of society and has to take care of the environment. So the objectives of business and governments, even if the roles are different in execution, but the objectives have become identical. Because also the government's objectives, of course, are creating prosperity, inclusiveness, uh, taking care of society and environment. But with stakeholder capitalism, which is the base of the um, functioning of the World Economic Forum, of our values and philosophy, I think here business has to take care not only of the owners or shareholders, but of society at large, environment. And I'm very pleased to see this concept, particularly because there are many family companies who have a long-term thinking, but not only family companies, to see it so well in place in this part of the world. So public-private cooperation and stakeholder capitalism together, I think, will be the pillars of success for the ASEAN countries. Wow. Professor, there are so many other things that I could seek your wisdom upon. Unfortunately, we're out of time. Pity. But, uh, <laughs> thank you for the interesting discussion. Thank you so much. A thank big you. hand to Professor Klaus Schwab. Thank you. Thank you so much.